Welcome to Sewing with Nancy and to my new series on sewing bridal gowns. Creating a wedding gown is not as difficult as it may seem. There are techniques to learn about fabric, special ideas on how to work with lace, and insights on working with veils. The overwhelming benefit is creating a one-of-a-kind gown. Susan Andrix, a bridal specialist and author of the book Bridal Gowns, brings her knowledge and insight to this series. Susan, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Nancy. I'm really excited to be here, and I'm looking forward to sharing some ideas with the viewers. Let's take a look at one of our brides and her gown. Sheila chose a high sheen polyester satin for a dress with an accent of ivory satin at the lower edge. Notice the interesting neckline trim, decorative stitching, and fabric rosettes. During this series, we'll share the details. Discover the joy of sewing bridal gowns next on Sewing with Nancy. Sewing with Nancy, TV's how-to sewing program with Nancy Zeman is being brought to you by Fof, the largest European producer of sewing machines. Fof's creative line of sewing machines and hobby lock sergers are simply the best. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears for home, classroom, and industry. Ginger scissors and shears are the choice of professionals. Oxmoor House, the publisher of innovative sewing, quilting, and craft books, including books by Nancy Zeman. Madeira thread from Germany with superior quality and smart packaging to make it a sensational value, preferred by home and professional embroiderers everywhere. And Nancy's Notions catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and unique, hard-to-find sewing notions and supplies. We'd like to begin by showing you various bridal fabrics and some specialty techniques. Susan, our first fabric is very luxurious. It's a silk shan tongue, Nancy, and it has very good body, holds, gathers and pleats very nicely. It's good for not adding unwanted extra pounds. The brocade can be used either on the right or wrong side. The bride should decide which side she likes better and use that. It doesn't need an underlining, which is common among other mm -hmm. bridal fabrics. And the hint would be to mark each pattern piece with a little tape so that you know which is the right or wrong side when stitching. That's right. And now we have a luxurious velvet. Velvet is good for uh, winter weddings. Mm -hmm. It takes a few special techniques to sew it so you don't crush the pile in it. Uh, I would choose designs w that are less complicated. Sure. Now when sewing the velvet, because of the nap fabrics, the two fabrics can work against each other and the sh the seams may shift. Here you can see at the sewing machine that I'm using the dual feet attachment or you could use an even feed foot so that when stitching this you'll have less shifting of the fabrics and even seams. That's right. But also another idea is when pressing to press over a like surface. We have a velvet board here which has a thick nap to it like a thick plush to it. If you did not have one of these you could work with a scrap of velvet fabric and put nap to nap and then working over a curved surface like we have a seam board and use plenty of steam and just kind of press. We're work, working on an angle so that it's not as easy to press as when you're on a flat surface but then Susan okay. your technique for that final press. What I do Nancy is I steam and then I simply press open lightly with my fingers. Velvet seems to react very nicely to steam. And a little finger pressing goes a long way. It does. Chiffon is our next fabric. We have it in a pretty blue color. Chiffon is very lightweight. It drapes well, a very floaty fabric. You would use a few special seams, a hairline seam, for example. You'd use the hairline seam when stitching curved seams, like in a princess bodice. And that simply is a straight stitch, and then you trim away the seam allowance or trim it narrow, and then zigzag the edges together, or you could serge it. That's right. If you would have a seam where you would like a, a French seam, a very traditional type of seam where it's two steps, you meet, instead of right sides together, wrong sides together right. the fabric. We have some tissue paper. That helps to stabilize the chiffon fabric so it doesn't get caught down in the throat plate. This is a fourth of an inch seam, and then again, Susan, you recommend to do some trimming. I do. I find if you trim it just a little bit before you turn it over and stitch the last, the mm -hmm. second seam, that it helps prevent any possibility of raw edge coming through. And then after pressing, you meet right sides together to encase the seam and then stitch with a 3 8 of an inch seam allowance. And here is the finished seam inside the sleeve. It looks very finished, lightweight. You don't even notice that it's there. That's right. 
the next series of fabrics we have to share with you are all kind of on the same order, even though they look quite a bit different. These are all bridal satins. The most common satin that you find in the stores today is acetate, mm -hmm. but it also comes in polyester and in silk. Wouldn't that be lovely? Oh, it's very luxurious. We have basic bridal satin. It's fairly lightweight, would do well with an underlining mm -hmm. or a lining. We have a jacquard. Again, right, wrong side, depends which you prefer. Either Mark will work. it with a little <laughs> tape. This is a peau de soie. It has low luster. It doesn't add unwanted pounds. We all like that. And then the fabric that you call that talks. Yes, taffeta. Taffeta rustles as you walk. It has its own body. It <laughs> gathers nicely. But it also water stains very easily. All three of these fabrics, or four of these last fabrics, many times require an underlining. And that's just another layer of fabric to add some body because many times the bridal top is almost like a corset. That's correct. And we'll be shaping that corset a little bit, but it needs some fabric weight. And we've used on this satin a very lightweight fusible. You want to give your recommendation about pressing? I would select a fusible that either uses low steam or no steam or one of the lighter um, weight fusibles that doesn't require right. as much heat. And then the other option would be to use a lightweight sewing interfacing or a batiste. And both of these fabrics, the sewing interfacing or the batiste fabric, would be stitched, stitching a half of an inch from the cut edge. That's right. That'll guarantee that your stitching won't come through when you stitch your 5 8 inch seam. And this gives the great body to the fabric. It does. It also helps prevent boning from showing through your fashion fabric. Now when stitching this type of fabric, you have to add some what we call taut sewing because on satins, even though the satin has been stitched properly, you still may get a few little puckers. That's right. It's very difficult to avoid puckers. But to avoid most of them, here you can see at the machine, I'm holding the fabric taut in front of the foot as well as in back of the foot. And your stitch length you recommend, Susan? Between a, around a two and a half millimeter stitch. So you just hold it tight and do the stitching. This bodice shows another type of seam that is really common in bridal wear, whether for the bridal gown, the bridesmaids, and that is a princess style seam. This hasn't been pressed yet, just so that you know, but it curves a very deep curve in the seam. And we both agree on how to sew this. We agree on all things here but regarding sewing, but this is so often taught differently, and that is when you have curved seams or any type of seam, we're taught to sew from the bottom to the top on both sides. But on this princess style curve, we have a concave and a convex seam meeting. Notice how the seam differences go in opposite directions. It seems as if those two edges will not come together. The seam allowance of one is, it seems longer than the other. And notice the curve. Susan, where do we put this? We put that we longer area put it underneath, next to the feed dogs. We let the feed dogs do some of our easing for us. And as I'm sewing this seam, you can see that that eases right into place because the feed dogs kind of bite the fabric and ease it in. They help ease it in. Bridal fabrics tend to be difficult to ease, and this is a method that I've found works very, very well. You'd stitch from bottom to top on one side, of course, and top to bottom on, on the, the other. other side. Whatever side is the longest, put that to the bottom. Now when doing the pressing on the princess style seam or any seam, we like to press the seam flat, just as if, just the way it has been sewn. And then press it open. And we're working over a curved seam and you would press open over a light curve. But notice the trimming that Susan has done on this seam. I trim, you trim the, the inside curve, just regular clips. You notch the outside curve mm -hmm. because when it opens, that'll help your seam lie flat and there won't be any bulk. So taking the time to doing the correct stitching techniques, the correct pressing techniques, will simplify working with bridal gowns. It will. This lovely gown designed by Allison features a shape fit in the bodice area. The bodice has three layers of fabric plus boning to achieve this perfect silhouette. Susan and I would like to share with you the techniques of shaping and stabilizing for a professional look. We just finished showing you how to work with underlining, but now we'd like to add a little extra stabilization with a stabilizing technique in the neckline area. That's right, Nancy. I like to use stay, a stay or stay tape mm -hmm. in any neckline 
that has a V or any kind of bias edge to it. You can buy the stabilizer or the tape or you can cut the selvage. Remember that the selvage is perpendicular from the cut edge of the fabric and you just trim it off. You don't need this in the seam, so use it. It's very stable. Use it for the neckline. That's right. I cut the, the stay and I lay it on my pattern right inside the 5 8 inch seam. Bring it down and just to the bottom of the V you want to measure this length right here. Then I trim it a quarter of an inch shorter than that. Okay, just a fourth of an inch off. That's correct. And then you double that measurement. For you double the, the measurement. When sewing this, then on this sample, you have it stitched to the neckline seam on the wrong side of the fabric. That's right. And you would stitch it with the neckline on the bottom. Next so to the feed dogs. The feed dogs will help feed that extra fourth of an inch in. And that just helps hug the bodice hug the neckline that's area. That's right. So that's a real simple stabilizing area that you could work on. On garments that are not bridal as well. You could use it that way. We have a bodice that is kind of in the getting to the completion stage. Now, throughout this series, we did not go through fitting of a bodice, which would definitely be the first step and that you do with all your clients. Absolutely. And in the companion book that accompanies this series, you'll find all those details. After you would get it fitted, then you would do, of course, the sewing techniques. And as we lift up the lining, you'll see the underlining and some extra little tidbits you'd like to pass along to us, Susan. That's right. No matter how well you sew a seam or press it open, satin as you can see here, doesn't like to stay open. I use a little catch stitch right around the deepest part of the curves in order to help that. Just doing some hand stitching to attach it to the underlining. Only the underlining, not the fashion fabric. Now the lining portion has the boning, and boning is a shaped area like a corset. That's correct. When we close it, you can kind of see the shaping, how it's shaped into the body. We put the curves in toward the body. Boning helps support the heavy weight of bridal skirts. Without it, it would be too much for the bodice. It would bodice. pull the dress down. Mm -hmm. So you shape this so that this goes next, the curve goes next to the body. That's right. Now, you explained to me that in almost all bridal patterns, it will have an area where boning should be placed. That's right. The minimum number of places to bone is in the back and in the side front. And it's kind of halfway between the side seam and the shoulder blades and the side seam and the bust line seam. That's correct. It's stitched to the wrong side of the lining, just with some straight stitches down the tape on each side. You may want to add extra boning if you had a great heavy skirt. When you might want to position or enforce the V area. That's right. You could add boning here if you have a particularly shaped neckline, you could mm -hmm. add a couple of bones there. You could even add extra bones if it were an off-the-shoulder style sure. with a very heavy fabric. So here we have lining, underlining, boning to give shaping to the bridal gown. Yes. Nancy is going to now demonstrate one of the many options you can use as a gown closure. The back of the wedding gown can be equally as elegant and interesting as the front. Cindy's graceful gown showcases a rayon georgette overdress with 50 tiny white buttons overlaying the zipper area. Yes, even the closure can be a focal point. Here are a few key pointers on working with the closure. I'm going to show you two things when working with the back of a wedding gown. The simplest is to purchase button loop tape. Button loop tape is elastic that simply you buy buttons or cover buttons to coincide with the closure and it simply loops over a very elegant closure that is zigzagged with tiny stitches to the very edge of the fabric. Many times you need a more substantial closure as part of the gown. This has a lap zipper but the zipper has been hand stitched the final row with machine stitching with the initial rows. You could use this technique on any formal gown not just for a bridal gown. In the book that accompanies this series, you'll find that one inch seam allowances are recommended at the center back. And at the center back of this dress, we have the lining attached at the neckline, and we've pressed under one inch on the left side and seven eighths of an inch on the right side, just a scant one inch seam allowance. Not basting the seam closed because satins and other fabrics tend to needle mark, leaving permanent holes in the fabric. The first sewing step is to place the zipper 
on the right side, on the underlay side, and overlap the fold next to the zipper teeth. I've already started to sew this into place, but rather than pinning at the outside of the fabric, I'm going to pin next to where I'm going to be stitching so that the pin marks, if there are any, would be covered with the stitching. On my machine, I've set up with a zipper foot so that I can stitch right next to the fold of the fabric. And as I said, I already partially stitched this, but you can see how easy this step is to do by just stitching next to that fold. I like to have my zipper extend just a little bit above the neckline as well. It's easier to handle and to get that closure right up to the top. So you'd stitch that entire length from the bottom to the top area. Now for some pinning, a little unconventional type of pinning. As I mentioned, some fabrics needle mark. You may want to check your fabrics, test it first. We do a lot of testing with specialty fabrics and simply overlap the left area on top of the right, covering the initial stitching. And you could put one pin at the top in the lining area, which I'll do now. But then for the remaining pins, use tape, sewer's tape that goes over the fabric to hold it in place. Do check it, of course, to see if the tape is compatible with your fabric, but I have tested it and it works very well. Now, as another guide, which you may want to consider with the sewer's tape, since it's a half inch wide and our stitching needs to be a half inch from the fold, just place a layer of tape down the area so that you have a nice guide where to do the stitching. Now, this step needs one more machine stitching, and that is to fold back the fabric, exposing the seam allowance, and I'm going to pin that to the zipper area. That way the zipper will be machine stitched on both left and right sides. I'll quickly snap off my zipper foot and exchange it to the other side so I can stitch close to the zipper on the opposite side and then just baste. And I'll do a long basting stitch just to hold it in place. After doing this basting, I'm going to do the hand stitching. And it isn't that difficult to do. Test some thread colors to make certain that it will be invisible on the stitching area or the seam line area. I have a thread that I've already knotted and I like to do a little back stitch, a hand, quick hand stitch. Sewing along the tape, I'm just going to stitch and just very, basically just take a little bit of the fabric so that you have a little bit of it sewn. Stitch about a fourth of an inch. Back again. And keep stitching down the edge of the tape. Just nicely hand stitching. And what I'd like to do is remove this tape before doing the next stitching. I'll show you on the finished sample that this is almost invisible when you take your time. I use contrasting thread, obviously, to show you more clearly but those hand-picked stitches are a fourth of an inch apart, just catching the fabric. A very elegant finish to a, what is normally a very functional area of the gown. Whether using a zipper closure, a button loop closure, or the combination of the two, it is truly interesting in the back as well as the front. <music>
Here's a hint from Ginger. When scissors and shears become dull, take five to six seconds to use a sharpening stone to resharpen the knife edge blade. Simply open your shears and grip the scissors firmly. On the knife edge blade, start in the center with the hone at the same angle with this, and sharpen upward. Repeat the strokes. After completed, wipe off the blade to remove any filings. I'm glad that you could join me on Sewing with Nancy. This is the second program of our series on bridal gowns. Sewing the wedding dress of your dreams, your daughter's dreams, or a granddaughter's dreams is well within your possibility. You'll find in this series information that will give you great confidence to sew with bridal fabrics, laces, and trims. Susan Andrex, a custom bridal specialist and author, is with me during this series to share her expertise on sewing for the bride. Susan, share with our viewers what's in store for them today. Nancy, today we're going to be talking about laces, trim, and embroidery, fabrics and designs that add a special touch to every gown. Meet a bride-to-be Cindy, whose lovely gown is a combination of satin back crepe and rayon georgette. The personalization of the dress came with stitching beautiful embroidery designs on the bodice and sleeve using pastel shades of embroidery thread. Discover the joy of creating wedding gowns next on Sewing with Nancy. We'll begin our study of bridal laces with all over lace, yardage that's 45 to 60 inches wide. That's true. It comes in a variety of colors and it matches some of the satins that are available. It has a floral design. You could use it either up and down or side to side. And it has a border on one or both of the edges that you can trim off and use in another spot on your dress. Now there is a right and a wrong side to this and I think here we have our right side. You find that by running your fingernail over and you'll find a ridge that's the right side. And on this particular cut yardage it is a little shinier on the right side than the wrong side so you'll have some indicators to some indicators. know the right from the wrong side. You may also want to consider in the sleeve area, bodice area to do some underlining because this fabric is a little bit rougher, may ir be irritating to the skin. So you have an underlining, it's hard to see but it's a veiling, a tool. I've just used simple bridal veiling for this underlining. It gives the sleeve a little bit of body, makes it a little less snag, makes prone. it more snag resistant. <laughs> yes, it's not as prone. And then you can just treat it as one using matching thread, not contrasting as we have done for the sample, but it keeps the look of the all over lace. It's easy to work with. Very easy. It's very economical to work with as well. You can buy a lot more yards of it at a less expensive price than some of your right. more expensive laces. And it gives a very stunning look. Here's a bridal gown with a handkerchief linen hemline. Notice the unique border trim. Deanna, when creating this, cut off the border and stitched it to follow the handkerchief trim. Also, the trim follows along the neckline. It's really a stunning gown made with ease. Now we had this handkerchief linen hemline and all over lace gown and now we're going to step up to a different type of lace and it's a re-embroidered lace. This is Alençon. It's French, re-embroidered and they come with various widths. Various widths. Most of them run only about 36 inches wide. They're mm -hmm. a little narrower than some of your other normal fabrics but it has a matching border, mirror image border and then mirror image motifs on either side. And the beauty of this is the re-embroidery. That's how obviously we talked it as that because it has a cording that follows the outline of the lace or the shape, of, I should say, of the floral design. And it's a ridge. It's very easy to shape, very beautiful once it's done on a bodice. And I think our viewers may be surprised how we're going to cut this because we're not, it's, it's very durable. It is. But rather than buying the lace the same day you buy the pattern and the fabric, your suggestion is to wait. That's true. Because re-embroidered lace can be pricey, my suggestion is to lay, bring your, do your fitting at home mm -hmm. and bring all your pattern pieces to the store and lay them right out on the lace yardage and so, then have them cut. So to make duplicate pattern pieces for fitting as well as for determining lace, make a mirror image of each pattern placing the pattern print side down next to your pattern paper, cutting it out, tracing and cutting, and here we can see we have marked one left side and one right side. 
And we have made, we made this mistake yesterday of making samples. We had two left, so mark them. <laughs> it's very easy to do that. So make duplicate pattern pieces. So in essence, you have everything you need for your garment. And then take these pattern pieces along with you when you're going to buy your fabric, the actual yardage. And then you're going to lay it out. Yes. What you'll do is you'll bring it to the store. You don't have to make these decisions finally at the store, but it gives mm -hmm. you a good indication. You can decide to put the motif in the center at the waist area mm -hmm. coming up and do a trim, different trim at the neckline or you can put the motif coming down the bodice and have this lovely scallop around your neckline. And you don't necessarily have to have the lace follow the shape, the exact shape of the bodice. No, you do not. And this is a good point to tell our viewers about this trim, this little fuzzy part at the top. This. This looks like a mistake or like it should be trimmed off, but in, in, in fact, this is the mark of an expensive lace, and you should leave it on. The fabric that we have just partial bar bodice right here to show you, but you'd have your complete bodice. You would not cut it out as per side seams as we did with the all-over lace. It would be shaped, and then you can see the nice contrast you get between the lace and the satin that's underneath. It's really pretty. It stands right out. It's gorgeous. We have a bodice in process up here and to show you how some decisions that Susan made as she was choosing to work with the re-embroidered lace. Well, I chose, Nancy, to use motifs at the top and give a little bit of neckline interest with the flowers sticking up over the edge of the bodice. And you can trim right next to the floral design. It will not ravel. It will not ravel. Then to get it to shape around the whole bodice, as I said, we did not seam it where the undergarment is seamed. You're going to cut between the lacings and just cut the netting. And then you would do some overlapping and zigzagging and then trim. Now the zigzag stitch is almost invisible to see. Here's a seam that has been overlapped and zigzagged and trimmed. And Susan, you did such a great job that when it's next to the satin, you can't see it at all. It's one of the beautiful things about working with these laces. They form right to your shape. Now, the lower edge treatment, again, is another area that you can make a design choice. Because this is a short bodice, I chose to trim the bottom half of the border off. But if I had a longer bodice mm -hmm. or a drop waist, for example, I would probably leave it whole. So you can simply save these extra motifs, use them perhaps in the back of the, well, you'd use them on the back of the bodice, or perhaps as a motif on the skirt itself. That's true. If you have extra motifs, for example, this one, you could cut it out mm -hmm. and put it on the train of the dress or on the sleeve would be a good place. So working with laces, whether they're by the yard or whether you're working with the re-embroidered lace, it's a simple step as long as you know the techniques of cutting, sewing, and shaping. Another elegant way to accent a bridal gown is with the use of trims. It's fun to choose between beaded organza, venice, or galloon trims, just to name a few. Here's how to easily add trim to a dream gown. We have the samples of the various trims I just detailed. But Susan, we'd like to start off by saying you're going to buy sets of some of these trims. Yes, Nancy. When you buy a motif, you buy them in pairs. And a set is a pair of motifs with matching scallop or other yardage trim. And this is really lovely. It's embroidered, it's beaded on organza, and we'll just show you one option, and there are many options, the way that you could place this on the gown. You can come down the center front of your bodice and create an interesting um, neck area. And two different people would do it two different ways, and it's really fun the way the differences that you can have this. Then the straight trim could go along the lower edge, and you could curve it because of the shape of the scallop area. And again, with lace, you can cut it and overlap it. And, and just zigzag. Just zigzag, and it conforms to the shape of the, the hem of the dress. Now, all of these trims, as well as the re-embroidered lace that we discussed earlier, would simply be tacked into place. Now, this one would probably require a lot of tacking because of the various details. This has a lot of what I call a snag problem, mm -hmm. and I would. I would tack each of the points, each of the ends, in place. 
But it's a non-weight-bearing, non-stress-bearing um, addition to your garment, sure. so you can use, just use a simple basting stitch. It's truly embellishment and hand stitching. And you do fit these when you're working with your brides when it is on them, correct? Yes, I pin it right on the bride while she's wearing the dress. That gives me the, the positioning sure. better than anything else. Our next set of trims is a venise. This is a heavier look. Venice is characterized by not having a background to it. And we have, again, the matched sure. set. And we'll show you another option. You could place it along the lower edge. We've practiced doing this, see if we can get them to match. And so you could try different ways with the bride, or if you're making it yourself, have someone help you determine how you'd like this to look. And then this edge, we could place along the top. Let's flip it around and again shape around the neckline and you could also carry this trim through to the skirt area. Yes, they're very effective when they're carried around the train of a dress. So you kind of get the general idea of how you could work with the sets and again you would buy this after you would fit the bodice so that you wouldn't overbuy on yardage. Galoon lace is interesting because it looks like you would possibly just stitch it on flat but this is not the way it's intended. No. You cut glue and lace apart, you have mirror images. Each side has the same scalloped edge. Glue and lace comes anywhere from an inch or a couple inches wide up to eight, eight, ten inches wide. And lace is pr truly one of the n most non-raveling fabrics around. It's not a fabric, it's a lace, but you can cut and it's not going to ravel. So you simply separate this. You can create your own sets of trims if you'd like. You have a double border. So half the amount of yardage will give you double the amount of trim. That's right. And two other examples you have here are, are lovely. These are uh, embroidered organza as well. And again, around the neckline, around the hemline, around the waist, up and down the sleeve. Mm -hmm. And when seaming these, we simply use a zigzag stitch and trim away the excess seam allowance. That's true. So you can see working with trims and laces can be done with great ease. Another option for embellishment is machine embroidery, and Nancy will show you a very creative technique. Another creative option for bridal gowns is to embellish designs on the fabric. This beautiful stitch enhances the Georgette fabric. A computerized embroidery machine supplied the creativity. You choose the thread color and placement, creating a one-of-a-kind fabric. You can embroider on practically any fabric. The key is to choose the correct stabilizer and the correct way of stitching on the fabric. And I'm going to ask you to test your fabric before obviously applying the design. The stabilizer is the first consideration. With a heavy concentration of thread, you definitely need a support on the fabric. On this satin fabric, first we chose a, an iron-on stabilizer. On the flip side, we pressed a stabilizer on. Now considering that the satin does not like steam, we use dry heat to position it. Place the fabric into the hoop and then found after removing the design that the hoop left a slight impression on the fabric all the way around. Obviously we did not choose this as an option. The option we went with was to work with a water soluble stabilizer. We have two layers of a stabilizer that we put in the hoop. We didn't put the fabric in the hoop, just the stabilizer sprayed adhesive fabric spray to the stabilizer, then put the fabric on top, then did the stitching. You'll see later on that you'll trim away the stabilizer, not to release it with water as many times as recommended because the fabric does not like water. But this is the stabilizer we chose, and I'll show you how we worked with this. You can also work with thread colorations. Do some sample stitching. The wedding gown worn by Sheila, which you'll see in just a few minutes, had some sample stitching. Marta Altu, who did the stitching of this gown or creating of this gown, chose for one example of a variegated embroidery thread to do the stitching. On the other half of this sample back bodice, she chose a tone-on-tone -tone thread. And you'll see the finished gown and the results in just a few minutes. But you can experiment with thread colors, stabilizer colors, and then also keep in mind needles. A size 80 needle is preferred, but each design and the giant designs we chose took about 10 to 15 minutes to stitch. After eight hours of stitching, you need to change the needle. So if you have many motifs on your gown, make sure you change that needle frequently. Set up your machine according to the instructions in your owner's manual. Each machine will be slightly different. And then do one more test. And this test really is going to be used as a template. A template to determine placement. 
we've used a sheer fabric, actually two layers of a sheer fabric, and stitched our motif on the sheer. We're going to use this by placing it over the fabric. But before taking it out of the hoop, what I'd like you to do is trace along the inside of the hoop with a marking pen. And then take it out of the hoop. Before taking it out of the hoop, mark the top. After taking it out of the hoop, then you can cut it out following that line. And we've done one of that one sample already to show you that this template now is going to be used for placement. The top position will help you when repositioning it into your hoop. If you're wondering exactly how are you going to use this, let me show you a bodice that we have in process. This particular bodice is going to have two motifs on it on either side of the v-neck line. One is already in position and to position the other we're again going to use this template and place the template on your fabric so that you have kind of a mirror image of your design. If you like the way this looks then within the seam allowances pin the template to the fabric. Now we're going to now just kind of set this aside for a few seconds and place two layers of stabilizer in the hoop, making certain that the stabilizer is very taut in that hoop. And I'll just punch it down a little bit and making it nice and taut. The next step is to use a temporary fabric adhesive spray, apply it to the stabilizer and then position the fabric on top of the hoop, aligning the template with the outer shape of the hoop. And I'm going to reposition this so that it looks just the way I initially stitched the template. Now unpin the template and make certain that the fabric is next to the adhesive and then place this into your machine. And that template has really done a lot of work for you. I'm going to slide it into place, make sure it's nice and flat. I'm going to lower the fabric, lower the presser foot, and then do begin the stitching. Let me just clip this thread. And then I'll just press the button and let it stitch. While it's doing the stitching, I may want to point out that I chose a thread color that's a little bit high in contrast so that you could see the design more clearly. Perhaps you'd like to have something that isn't quite as high contrast in a bridal gown. But the key is using that template to get it positioned just right. This design takes approximately 10 minutes to stitch out, so I'm going to stop this now and show you the finished gown. Later on, I'll show you how this looks in the completed form. But each design would be positioned in the same manner. On Sheila's wedding gown, where we have a different design stitched, you'll notice how the template could be used to position it around the neckline and sleeve. An enhancement of a bead further makes this decorative a great way of enhancing a gown. Hope you've enjoyed learning about working with trims and laces in regards to bridal gowns. I wanted to show you the sample that I just finished stitching using the computerized sewing machine to stitch two designs. Remember to make that template so that you know exactly where to position the fabric and the hoop so that you can get that design positioned whatever you'd like. Now you would pop the design out of the hoop and trim away the stabilizer. Susan and I will be back with more ideas on working with bridal gowns next on Sewing with Nancy. Here's a hint from Madeira. When sewing with metallic thread, take time to team up the best needle and thread combination. Start with Madeira's metallic needle to avoid thread stripping and breakage. Next look at thread options. Madeira's textured metallics add a delicate shimmer, while Madeira's smooth metallics add a sparkly shine. A third option is Madeira's heavy metal thread. As the name implies, this heavier thread gives a richer, filled-in look. Madeira offers three options for elegant stitching opportunities. Here's a hint from Pfaff. When working with Pfaff's fantasy embroidery unit or free motion embroidery, use these tips. Slip the stabilizer underneath the hoop instead of including it in the hoop. You'll be able to keep the fabric very taut with this idea. 
Double check that you've lowered the presser bar in the sewing position. It's an easy step to forget. And change the needle with each new design. Sometimes there are thousands of stitches in a design. The needle tip easily dulls and could snag your work. Now, enjoy the process. Welcome to Sewing with Nancy. This program is a third show of our series on bridal gowns, where you've learned techniques for creating one-of-a-kind wedding gowns. In this program, you'll get the latest information on special accents, making fabric rosettes, creating headpieces, and even custom making lace. Joining me once again is Susan Andrex, a custom bridal dressmaker and author. Susan, your knowledge of making bridal wear is inspiring. Thank you, Nancy. It's been a real pleasure sharing ideas with our viewers. We're going to cover some more of those ideas today, because there's still a lot to learn. Let's take a look at a personalized gown. In an earlier show, you saw Sheila's gown from the front. Here's the back view. It is a stunning gown with beautiful rosette accents on the train. Notice the interesting fabric colors used in combination with the white gown. Susan and I would like to show you the rosette technique next on Sewing with Nancy. You just had the advantage of seeing Sheila modeling this gown, but now you can look at the very back area, get a close-up of the cascades of rosette that goes down the train area. Nancy, one of the most fun things about making your own gown is th that you can do unusual things mm -hmm. with it. On this gown, we've got a, a garden variety of sure. rosettes. We have, that's peau de soie there mm -hmm. in several different colors. We have an organza. It has a little bead. With some beads that have been glued. We have um, bridal illusion or tulle on that one. And they're just scattered on and then stitched right in place. Fun. And in combination with the rosettes, you'll see that there's machine embroidery. In the second program of this series, I detailed how to do embroidery on bridal fabrics. And here we have the rosettes co combined with the embroidery plus beads stitched into place. A lovely combination. Now you can see get the inspiration of how to use rosettes perhaps on a bridal gown, or you could use it on a bridesmaid's dress. Yes, the, the back interest on a bridesmaid's dress is almost as important as mm -hmm. a bride, and you use a, a chain of rosettes across the back for a little bit of interest. And a good hint that Susan passed along to me is always use odd numbers, especially if you're using smaller numbers, like three or five of a rosette, as opposed to two or four. Right. Now to make this, you're going to have to cut the fabric on the bias, a 45 degree angle. The true bias works the best for rosettes. It gives the softest appearance. So this is cut on the bias, and you can see the little give in the fabric. And we have a width that's four and a half inches wide. By about 18 to 24 inches long. That gives you a good full rosette that's about two inches in depth. If you'd like it wider or narrower, just experiment with your fabrics. Now we folded the fabric in half, meeting the cut edges, and we're meeting also the wrong sides. So you're exposing the right sides. And then you would curve the fabric along the end so that it would curve up to the fold area. This has been surged. We've used a four thread serger to serge the edges, sewing it together, but it will also create the gathers. That's right, and if you don't have a serger or prefer not to use mm -hmm. one, you can stitch two rows of gathering stitches to achieve the same thing. Then simply find the two needle threads and gather, or the two basting threads and lightly gather this. You can gather it tight together or have it, of course, just soft. It will all depend upon your fabric. The weight of the fabric makes a determination mm -hmm. as to how gathered or loose the rose ends up being. If you used a tool, you would gather a little bit more than this satin. Now, forming the rosette takes some hand sewing and a little creative just, license. Just a little bit. If you want a center to your rosette, which you can purchase in this form at any fabric store, really, just take a few, put it into the center of your gathered rosette, fold the end down so that it forms a little fold, and stitch. Then start rolling the rosette as tight or as loose as you want, and stitch a couple of stitches. Keep folding and rolling and stitching. It doesn't take very long to create them. It really doesn't. 
after you have created all the stitching and rolled it, and this one is just plain without any stamen added to the middle, you need to encompass or enclose that lower edge. And Susan, on this one you have a nice little cap for the edge. You simply cut a circle that is about a half an inch wider in diameter mm -hmm. than the bottom of your rows and whip stitch it in place. Now here are close-ups of some other fabrics to show you different sizes, different fabrics, and the different look that you'd get. We'll show you a little bit later the headpiece, and these work great as headpiece accents. They're a lot of fun to make, and they're very, really very easy. Mm -hmm. Now after you have them made, we'll need to show you how you to attach them to your gown or later on to your headpiece. But if we look on the inside of this gown, again, hand stitching is what is important. You'll have a lot of hand stitching on your bridal gowns. And notice they've been securely tacked to the fabric, the satin fabric, and they just cascade down the back of this train. So whether you're making rosettes for a train, for a headpiece, or for the back of a bridesmaid dress, these were the simple techniques, cutting the fabric on the bias, serging, twisting, and doing some stitching, and you have great fabric rosettes. Whether you purchase or create a bridal gown, you can easily make and customize a headpiece. Sheila's gown with rosettes along the train also has rosettes on the headpiece. Susan has great ideas for creating veils as well as headpieces. You know, the headpiece really doesn't take that long to create, and many people might be afraid to do that, Susan. It's actually easier than it looks, Nancy. A little bit of time, a little bit of glue, and you're there. We have different head forms that you can get at your favorite fabric center and point out the, the common types. Well, we have a bandeau here that can be worn either on top of the head or to the side. This is a tiara. It can be worn either with the point down or the point up. This is a teardrop shape. This is very pretty. And this is what I call a, a barrette style. And we're going to work on this process, and so you have started to cover this buckram type shape on, with fabric. Yes, you simply roll the shape around your fabric and mark, and then trim a margin so that you can glue. We've already started the gluing here, and it's very easy to simply glue a little bit. It gets a little warm. It does. <laughs> you have to be very careful when you're working with a glue gun. And glue a little more. But it also dries very quickly, so you only want to work with a small portion at a time. Mm -hmm. And you smooth it down like so. And the fabric is going to be covered, so really this gluing is perfectly all right. That's right. It dries clear, mm -hmm. and it dries flexible, actually. And so it dries quite really quickly, too. And you're creating some tucks as we're going along, placing the glue around the edges. And you okay. just use I'll as much. I'll give you a little hand here. Thank you. Just use as much or as little as you need. If you have a little extra margin, like we do on this mm -hmm. side, you would trim that away with scissors afterwards. Now, you can create this in a, many different sequences, but I'm going to show you the inside of this form, one of them that we have already in creation. And you can see we have pink ribbon. You wouldn't have used pink ribbon, but we did it for contrast. And it's about a half of an inch wide. But the interesting detail, it almost goes by unnoticed, and that being the snaps. I like to make all of my veils detachable. There's nothing worse than standing at a reception and having yourself pulled from side to side when people are giving you hugs. So, so I put snaps on the inside of, of every headpiece. I space them about an inch apart. Mm -hmm. I stitch them to the ribbon first, and then I glue the ribbon in. That does two things, puts the snaps in and covers the edges, the raw edges of the fabric on top of the headpiece. Now the veiling, actual veiling, you can buy probably more easily at the fabric store, already trimmed if you'd like, yes. with pearls or ribbon, rather than making it. That's true. They do come pre-made. But it, another hint would be to add a permanent poof so that if you would detach the train, or the veil, I should say, excuse me, like this has a little poof on it, you would have that if you would unsnap the veil at a later time. That's right. It still gives the effect of having of the veil on. Now the poof can be a variety of widths. That's right. A poof width height depends on mm -hmm. your height, your height in relation to your groom. Sure. 
and the whole feeling of your wedding. We have about an eight inch fabric strip that has been folded in half mm -hmm. and then I'll let you finish the job. We zigzagged over a cord and here's the cord. Thank you. And just gather this. This is not going to stand up on this one. Gather to a poof and you gather it to the size of your headpiece wherever you're going to put your poof. So if you have a bandeau it would be a little bit wider. Mm -hmm. Okay, you simply gather it up and then you make a poof. <laughs> and you pull it apart literally like this and there is your poof. And if we were working with this area we could attach it to the back. Glue it on or stitch it on? You would glue it on. If you're making it a permanent permanent poof you would simply take a little bit of glue right on the edge of your headpiece like this and hold it in place for a few seconds. Now we're not having the advantage of working over a, a flat surface but if you had that you could pin it in place temporarily to you hold it while it, it dries. Place. It actually it dries very fast. Very fast. Now the next step would be to cover the top of the form with some laces and we're just placing this down but it's just to show you how quick this goes together. Here's one of the rosettes that we just created. Now one of the interesting details that I think is so important for this is your shape of the shape and the flow that you'd like to have of the, your headpiece. You need to have movement on your headpiece. If you notice this headpiece has a movement to it this way. Mm -hmm. You could do an S shape. Uh, you could go the opposite direction. It's more pleasing to the eye to yeah. have a, to have movement and to have it asymmetrical rather yes. than symmetrical. Again, the one three five mm -hmm. rule of thumb. One or three or five rosettes or odd numbers. Now to attach this to the bride's head, we, you'd like to use a barrette, a spring-loaded barrette. And these can be purchased again at any craft store or any really fabric, fabric store. store. Uh, you simply go. And then wrap it with florist tape. Now this is an interesting comment. Pull the florist tape oh, there you just go. slightly so it stretches. That gives it a little tack. And then simply wrap. And that will adhere to the hair a little bit. It adheres the barret to the hair so it doesn't slide. So that would then be glued to the underside of the headpiece. We kind of have a combination of various headpieces with the beginning of a poof. This one which would have just a, a veil attached. And this one, of course, which does have the veil attached right into place, snapped into place. It's lovely the way it goes together. They're very quick to put together. Just planning by coordinating some of the elements from the gown, placing them on the headpiece as well as the veil. It's a fun way to complete a look. Absolutely. Nancy's going to show you how to take full advantage of computerized embroidery machines by creating three-dimensional embellishments. Make your own lace embellishments once again with the help of any computerized embroidery machine. The butterfly motifs adorning the headpiece of this veil were easily made with pastel threads, sheer fabrics, and a specialty stabilizer. You can easily stitch on lightweight fabrics providing you use the right tools. Let me show you the dress fabric, the overlay fabric that was used on Cindy's bridal gown. It has many embroidery designs on it as well as the veiling and headpiece with the designs that are detachable or like lace. This very lightweight fabric and the detailed designs many times don't think you wouldn't think they were compatible. But with the help as I mentioned of stabilizers they certainly are. Traditionally we use a tearaway stabilizer or a washaway stabilizer but on sheer fabric, sometimes those stabilizers add too much bulk. So rather than using the traditional type of stabilizer, I'm going to recommend that you use a liquid stabilizer. I've started to stabilize some chiffon fabric working on a cutting surface or a cutting mat. You could use a, a Formica tabletop, just add a little of the stabilizer and spread it around. You could use your fingers or in this instance I'm using a paintbrush to let it or to evenly distribute it on the fabric and I've started to do it on this side already. Let this dry until it's completely crisp and then you can start to sew. Now this may seem rather unusual but let me show you the results. 
Here's the fabric without any stability. Very lightweight, drapable, a great fabric to work with as an overlay. And here's the same fabric with the liquid stabilizer in the dried state. Very crisp. We've done some sample stitching on, on this particular sample. We've washed out the stabilizer from this half, left it in in the other, so that you can see it's stiff enough to support the designs Yet when the design or the stabilizer is washed away, it allows the fabric to be very drapable, once again in its original state. The thread that we chose for this particular project is a rayon thread. You could use pastels, as you saw in this headpiece, a variegated thread which I'm going to stitch with next, or of course you could use tone-on-tone -tone thread. Lightweight thread in the bobbin is what is recommended. To use a bobbin thread or a compressed bobbin might be a good suggestion. New needles. I can't stress this enough. A size 80 needle works well with embroidery, but considering the lightweight fabric, you may have to change that needle more frequently than you would with a more stable fabric. Set up your embroidery unit according to the owner's manual instructions, and I'm ready to hoop the fabric. Here's some of this fabric, very crisp fabric, put into the layer, into the hoop. Very, make sure it's taut when it's in this hoop, and simply slide it underneath the presser foot area and attach into place. I like to begin by stitching a few stitches in place, cutting the threads, and then just letting the unit sew by itself. It seems at first a little unusual that such a lightweight fabric can support all this thread, all this design, but really we're creating lace, and because we have stiffened this fabric, we have a lightweight thread in the bobbin, and a relatively lightweight thread on the top, it can easily sew by itself and it works out so well. This design takes approximately 10 or 12 minutes to stitch, so you can kind of get the idea of how the butterfly is being shaped. We're using the variegated thread, and I'm going to stop it now and finish it a little bit later, but show you exactly what happens to the fabric. If you're making the lace motif detachable, then I would not rinse the fabric, rinse away the stabilizer. I'd leave it crisp. I've placed several butterflies in this area, making them close together because I'm simply going to cut them out. And cut close to the stitching. It's not going to ravel. You just trim away as easily as you can. And we can trim away some of these extra little thread tails. And I, you can see that's really a very simple process. Again, here are some other designs that were used on our veil that we showed you earlier. And let me show you the design once again. We have the detachable lace motifs created but just by stitching on the organza, positioned to the headpiece just with hand stitching. It makes it very elegant, beautiful, and the designs coordinate with the fabric. I hope that we've inspired and encouraged you to work with bridal fabrics to create beautiful wedding gowns. I'd like to thank Susan for being my guest. It's been inspiring having you here, Susan. Thank you, Nancy. I've really enjoyed being here and sharing some ideas with our viewers. All of the techniques that we showed in this series are in the book Bridal Gowns by Susan, published by Palmer Pletch. It's a terrific reference book. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now. Visit Nancy's website at www.sewingwithnancy.com for more information on this program. Sewing with Nancy has been made possible by grants from the following companies. FOP, simply the best European line of sewing machines. Ginger, a tradition of quality in scissors and shears. Oxmoor House, publishers of sewing, quilting, and craft books. Madeira Threads, designed for home and professional embroiderers everywhere and Nancy's Notions Sewing Catalog, featuring specialty sewing books and notions. <laughs>